for an entire generation. People have experienced Star Wars the only way it's been possible, on the TV screen. But if you've only seen it this way, you haven't seen it at all. This is the podcast you're looking for. We've been waiting for you. Hi, this is Megan from Blog Full of Words, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z and Corey Club. This is the podcast you're looking for. Well. Hello and welcome to our book review of Razor's Edge on Coffee with Kenobi. Corey and I will be discussing Martha Wells' book Razor's Edge, a very popular Star Wars novel currently available for purchase. Joining us on today's discussion is Megan from Blog Full of Words, Knights Archive, and Fangirl Blog. Welcome, Megan. Hello. Hello. Well, Megan, we are very excited to have you on the show talking about this. I know you are a big Star Wars fan and a voracious reader and You've been gracious enough to um, interact with us on email and through Twitter, and we know you've got some great insights, so we're just going to kick it off uh, with your overall thoughts on the book, and did it meet your expectations? I had a lot of expectations going into this one because I listened to a lot of the feminist talk in the Star Wars blog community, and people were really excited about the fact that this was focusing on Leia, and we haven't gotten a novel focusing on Leia. Um... So the expectations were very high for the not only the quality of the book, but the diversity of the characters. And I think it did deliver in a lot of ways. Um, it immediately it has two female characters. It has one woman of color. It makes sure to establish that there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of diversity in the book. And that was great. Um, we'll get into the plot. The plot was, was good as well. But yeah, I think it definitely lived up to my expectations. And Corey, what about you? I know, and I think the three of us, just like we had with our our Kenobi chat with Amy and Trisha, we've got very, uh, we've got similar opinions, but the way we get them are, are quite different. How did you feel overall, Corey, about the book? Well, I, I, I kind of like you said, Megan, uh, you said it was going to center on uh, Leia, and I was excited too because it's like there's nothing really out there that's really just from her viewpoint. She's not my favorite character, but uh, I'm willing to read anything of Star Wars, so I gave it a shot, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, going in, I didn't know what to expect, but the setting where it was set between um, A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, uh, I felt it was kind of like, you know, well, what are you going to talk about? You know, type thing. We, it's just basically this random, you know, adventure or whatnot. So going into it, I didn't really have high expectations, but in the end, I think it was a great little adventure, uh, some great characters, some great interactions, and then a great female lead. So, yeah, it was great. Well, that was the thing that was the most important to me. I knew that this first book in this trilogy, which apparently is not really much of a trilogy anymore, they've come out and said, but I knew that Leia was the feature character, and I was interested because sometimes I think we as Star Wars fans overplay uh, the strength of her character. I, I, that's still something I very much struggle with. In fact, I just talked to the professor last week who told me if I told her that Leia was a strong female character – that she would not sign off on my master's thesis. <laughs> she actually said that. And I said, well, you know, tell me why you feel that way. And I'm pretty sure that she looked at Razor's Edge, she would probably change her mind. Because what you've got here is a multifaceted character. And, and really, Martha Wells, and we talked about this on our, on our, our book chat with her, but she was in, in many ways restricted by what she could and couldn't do because – You've got this character who's just recovered from the destruction of her planet. And she's got this these burgeoning feelings for Han Solo and just trying to be a strong character. But we see the vulnerability in her. We see her making these decisions and people looking to her to lead by example and through action. She becomes much more multifaceted than I think possibly we have seen from her on a consistent basis. Did, did you catch that as well? It's interesting that both of you say that Leia was not like was not one of your favorite characters. Um, honestly, she wasn't one of my favorite characters either. I didn't um, pay much attention to her when I first started watching the movies, and um, I tend to like Force users more. She just wasn't really on my radar, but she's been discussed a lot in the fandom, and there's been so many different ways of portraying her, from the comics to the 
novels to her being a supporting character in other novels. So it was this book was really me sort of trying to figure out what I thought of Leia in a way.、Um, and I did like her. I like that they showed different kinds of strength that she had. She was diplomatic. She was she could physically fight all sorts of things,、mm-hmm. um, but also she was vulnerable. And Alderaan was a big deal. Yeah, and this book maybe more than anything that I've seen, and I know that、um, there are, there's the comic book series that's which Corey is going to talk about in a little bit, but it, it shows the impact that that has because in the film now it's called A New Hope for a reason. So it's not dwelled upon. It, Leia isn't sitting around moping like Bella in that in that god awful Twilight series, but but sorry, I couldn't resist. But but she it clearly impacts everything that she does, and it should. We're talking about the destruction of her entire world, so we're seeing a vulnerability and flaws in doubt, and that's an important thing to portray in Leia. I mean, Corey said she wasn't his favorite character. It's not. I actually like Leia. I've always liked Leia. I think when it comes to her and Padme, I don't really know who I'd pick. I'd probably lean more towards Leia because I'm more of an original trilogy guy. But I didn't know how strong a novel would be with her in it, and she was the best part. I absolutely agree. And like we said,、um, there's a lot of parallels. We talked about this with Martha about the the new Star Wars、uh, comic series where it kind of delves back into、uh, the original trilogy era and has the the, the kind of the big three going on these these adventures, and it has Leia kind of this. Uh, would you call it a secret mission?、Uh, you know, kind of going on and getting、um, going on secret missions and just finding out things. And the comparisons between that, I haven't read a whole the comic series a whole lot. I don't know if you have Megan.、Um, I read the first volume. Okay, so、uh, I guess Megan, maybe a question to you would be: Do you find parallels between Leia's character from the comic series and this book? Um, she's called to do very different things in the series and the book, and、uh, I think in yeah, I do find parallels in that she's very she's straightforward. She goes after what she wants.、Um, the book could get inside her head more than the comic did,、mm-hmm. and I liked that.、Um, like you said, she wasn't moping, but Alderaan was was an issue, and it was always there in the back of her head. And sort of the subtlety of how she dealt with that was really well done in the novel. I thought in the comic it was a little less subtle, but that could also just because they had to portray it in dialogue. It's a comic;、sure. you couldn't get it、uh, in the same way. Yeah, it's the medium. Did it, did either of you read? There's an old Marvel comic、uh, where Leia encounters a stormtrooper and they're trapped somewhere, and he finally takes off his helmet, and he's from Alderaan, and he's got a piece of rock around his neck from Alderaan, and that was maybe the only time that I'd seen in the expanded universe until recently that being addressed in this fashion. <laughs> wow, no, I haven't read that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I've never seen that comic, and but that's inter- very interesting to me. That's that's pretty strong connection there. It really is, and it, when we're talking about Leia, I mean, I think I've already pretty much said who my favorite character in the book was. But what about the two of you? Who was your favorite character? Maybe the strongest character you thought in the book was it Leia or was it someone else? I thought that Leia carried the book well.、Um, But I was really happy that there were cool side characters. I really liked Sion,、um, the rebel pilot. I really liked Anna Carrot because Twi'leks tend to fall into certain cliches. They're the dancers or they're the bounty、mm-hmm. hunters, and she was none of those things. And she actually sort of disappears toward the end. But I like that because it meant that she wasn't feeling that like. Oh, I'm Twi'lek. I'm so shiny and important. Roll, <laughs> but she was just she was just really cool. Like she was scarred and kind of like buff, and I thought she was cool. She was cool. What about、mm-hmm. you, Corey? Well, I will say Le- Leia was my favorite character,、uh, and she did, like you said, Megan. She carried the book very well.、Um, and I think, I, like I said before in their interview, we, my comparison to her was.、Um, I think her name was Laura Roslin in the、uh, Battlestar Galactica series. Where it's, oh, interesting! It's just because she's a flawed character. She's not. She's thrust into a position she doesn't want to be into, and、uh, she's this, this back of her mind thing. Like in the series, Laura Roslin has has cancer, and she's got to battle that in her mind. Other you know, as long along with putting up with politics,、uh, you know. These all these threats, and then here we here comes Leia, and she's basically almost a very similar character, where she you know is thrust in this position of politics and has to be a leader, and she comes out you know 
a shining star as far as you know leading the rebellion in this little group. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, back in the back of her mind, she's got Alderaan and and just the the, the feelings there. So I think that she's a very strong character uh, in this book and leads it really well. And I and I'm going to say, I mean, I know I mentioned Leia was my favorite, but just to, for a difference, because I'm not sure we haven't talked about him yet, but but Han Solo, yeah, really comes to the to the limelight here. Uh, and I think the biggest victory for this novel is the fact that you were able to get into the voice of both Han Solo and Princess Leia in a very accurate way that made me feel like I was still in in the world between episodes four and five, like it was something that could have leapt off the silver screen onto the page. And I still think that you don't see that often enough in the expanded universe, particularly with the original trilogy characters. So how did you both feel about the voices of of Leia and Han. We can talk about Luke later because I don't know if that was necessarily a strength, but it probably wasn't supposed to be. But what about the voices of Leia and Han in this? I compared it myself. I compared it to... Um, I'm going to forget his name now. Um, the, Thrawn, the Thrawn series. Um, what's his Thrawn? I, no, no. the uh, <laughs> No, not Thrawn. Timothy Zahn? Timothy Zahn. That's what I'm saying. I, I compared it to Timothy Zahn's uh, relationship or how he writes them. And obviously wow. that's... You know, high far, praise. Well, it's very high praise. And because it's... But actually, you figure that that book is further down the line. You know, they've already developed a relationship. You know, they've gotten on with their uh, romantic relationship. And this... To be able to write that without having that is it had to be hard to do, and like I said, it's setting between a new hope and empire, and just to, for her to get inside the heads of of Han Solo and and Princess Leia and and just kind of just spark at little uh, little snippets of of that, just kind of remind us of what we like I said, Dan, it could be pulled right into the movie screen and be like, oh yeah, that that goes right along with what we've seen thus far and it just builds on that. So I, I think it was really well done and, and, and very hard to do in this era setting. I was going to use that spark, that word spark to, um, <laughs> I, I know it's kind of a cliche word, but they were like, they were angry at each other at times. They were really sarcastic. I thought some of Han's dialogue was good. I don't, um, you guys will know what I mean when I say I don't really ship that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't like Han and Leia are not my favorite, but I hmm. thought that it was really interesting to get to see them between the two movies because we haven't seen a lot of that. So normally their relationship isn't something that I really care about. I don't dislike it. I just don't really feel either way about it. Interesting. Well, we I think Megan, well, now that we have you sharing a cup of coffee with us, tell us why you, that has not been something because typically that's one of the things I know that that Trisha Barr is. That's I think that's one of her. Yeah. <laughs> things that she likes the most but why do you why do you take the opposite route i'm I'm fascinated by this yeah well um i'm glad you asked that because that ties a lot into how i view leia um i I wouldn't say that i take the opposite perspective of her at all because i don't dislike them it's just not like a part of star wars i was really into um i got into star wars when i was a teenager and i really identified with luke like i wanted to get off the desert planet too (laughs) and um i he was the character that I liked the most, I felt like I could identify with him. Leia, while she's canonically the same age, had accomplished so much more. She was a princess. She was in politics. She was a soldier. She had done all this. She was like an adult figure to me. So I know there was a love triangle in the movie, but it almost felt like to me, like Leia and Han were the parents and Luke was the kid. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was very (laughs) mythological of you. Uh, they, uh, yeah, that's just, that's just how I, I saw it. So Han and Leia were sort of, they were, they were untouchable to me, kind of. And, well, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. I, I'm happy to hear that there is, that's one of the things I, again, I love about talking with all of our intelligent Star Wars fans is there are just so many different ways to pour through this galaxy. The thing that I liked about, uh, their tension, because there was definitely legitimate tension in this. The book wasn't all yeah. about that, but I think that was where Martha was at her strongest in her voice. It's very hard to accurately capture the voice of a character that millions and millions of people know and love. And they all think that they know the definitive way that that character should sound. I think she was able to find that. And perhaps the strength of this, and we talked about this in our interview with Martha as well, is that she doesn't reveal all of her cards. And we don't, we still, the, the power of the Empire Strikes Back as far as. You know, their first scenes together and the kissing scene and then I love you, I know. 
all that stuff still holds the power and the gravitas that it should because we see a burgeoning relationship between the two of them, but it's not fully exploited or fully even – Leia doesn't even let herself go in that direction and it's not always clear what Han is thinking, although we can get a pretty good idea uh, based on what, what we have for us. Now, I don't think that Luke is portrayed as strongly in this. In fact, Luke doesn't even feel like Luke. Luke just feels kind of like a, a random rebel pilot. That, and, and he also kind of gets um, – the snot kicked out of him a little too easily for my taste as well. I was actually reading your review of this book before I came on the podcast, and I mm-hmm. wanted to talk about that because I agree that Luke was not strong in this book, although he did. Oh, uh, what's our spoiler policy? Are we going to? Oh, our spoiler, spoiler policy? policy? No, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, spoilers. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he he caught the spy at the end. He's the one that yeah. knocked Kifar out. He, True. Like, um. But and not not. In pretty much the same kind of way that short round would would get somebody in Temple of Doom, it wasn't like <laughs> exciting. Person, but but I know he's early in his Jedi ness. The the other thing, um, I read this like most of us. I'm sure I read this book shortly after reading Crucible, and the difference between Luke in Crucible and Luke in Razor's Edge is so massive. Um, and it was interesting to me to see that change in his how much power he had because you could see how he had developed and how he had grown so much. I liked that he was less impressive in this book because it, it showed how much he had grown or would grow in the future. The, the thing about Luke in this, and, and I don't need him to be all powerful. I don't even need him to be remotely powerful, but it, it, this is the guy we're talking about that just blew up the Death Star and, and uh, you know, he hasn't faced Vader yet, but I don't know. I, I think maybe in the way that he approached things and I don't know, he just... He didn't sit well with me, and I sort of expected him to be a side character. The fact that she nailed Leia and Han, that helped me stomach that. I don't even know if stomach that is the best word, but that helped, that helped me digest that a little bit more. Corey, what do you think about Luke? I was going to say, I'm going to make another comparison here, and, and it might be totally off, but I felt like Luke was kind of like, uh, okay, in Back to the Future, we've got you know <laughs> Marty McFly, and he's going back in, in a time, and he's kind of mm-hmm. hanging out with his mom, I guess, and they're kind of the main characters. And then we got George McFly, the kind of the buffoon, kind of stumbling around. <laughs> you thought the, Luke was like that? No, no, no. I, yeah, I thought Luke was more of like a George McFly, like, hey, guys, you know, doing his thing. Not that he was, like, goofy, but, like, sure. I mean, he just played that role, that, that side role, pretty well. I mean, I didn't expect Luke to, you know, start swinging a lightsaber and like that. And, 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 no. You no. know, start forcing, force choking all kinds of people. But uh, no. I, I – like you said, the end there where he punched the guy out was kind of like the, the George McFly moment, you know? <laughs> well, he, he did destroy the Death Star, but he's also That's from true. Tatooine, where the most exciting thing is probably the Jawas bringing all the droids in. <laughs> so I think he, he can be goofy a little bit at this stage, but that's just me. True. Oh, this is good. I'm, I'm happy we're <laughs> debating Luke. I, I didn't think we'd go this one. That's good. That's good stuff. <laughs> Listeners, please uh, let us know uh, what you think about Luke's role in this book as well. Oh, absolutely! I think you know, interact with the Facebook page. I think it's, and all in all, I think it's it's a he's a good character, and he'll have his role. I mean, in the next in the series, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so nice. I'm excited to see that too because I do like Luke, and oh, he's and great. Yeah. As as we're he's talking great. about him, he you know, we'll get away from the the big three for a little minute. What did you think, you guys, about the role of diversity? Um, some of the other characters. Um, I guess we're talking spoilers, so it'd be like the, maybe the pirates. Uh, the other crew of the Alderaan ship. Um, what was your perspective on the like the, the class of aliens and things like that? Uh, I guess I'll start out with this. Um, I was so happy that there was so much diversity and just people were casually mentioned like, oh, this guy's dark-skinned and then it never really comes up again. That's just what he is. Um, and there were a couple different. There were there was a core and there were Twi'leks. Um, I did think that some of the minor characters blurred together. A lot of them talked with talk the same way so some of them i had i could picture them very easily but when they started speaking to each other i was kind of like who is who's talking here i think um they could have been a little more distinct but a lot of them i really love that is one of the strengths of the book Uh, the thing um as far as the non-canonical characters sometimes when you when you read an expanded universe novel or really any novel uh, the side characters uh, that are not as well rounded, they do blend together, like Megan just mentioned. And I thought there were times, you know, they have this dramatis persona. I think that's the correct way to pronounce it. 
at the beginning of these of the newer expanded universe now. So I found myself continually flipping back. Okay, now which one is this one? Which one is this one? Yeah. And and I do think it kind of got a little muddied after a while, and I found that a bit distracting. And honestly, uh, two thirds through, I just stopped flipping back because I just thought, well, whatever. I, I'm sure I'll figure it out, and I did. Um, <laughs> I, I did enjoy um, the, uh, and I, don't, I guess we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but I, I did enjoy uh, some of the major conflicts. Um, did did either of you feel like um, through the diversity of the characters and the different things that popped up, did you ever feel like there was ever real peril for people in this in this novel? Well, that's a good question uh, because going in, we obviously know that you know the big three aren't going to die. Correct. You know. And I guess I, in my mind, I didn't expect them to die. I didn't expect a whole lot of action. Which there was some shootouts. I mean, talking there was like, more action than Kenobi, yeah. probably. Well, I was just gonna say. I mean, there's some shootouts, and I think the, there's a cantina scene where they're shooting out, you know, some quick draw stuff. And and I think, like you said, Dan, the peril is there, but it's not all much for like the big characters. We know they're gonna live through it. Um, did you? I, did you? Either of you feel like though that the um, the the Alderanians that they were in danger? I thought that's they were in, they yeah, were yeah. I was I was ready for yeah. Some yeah. something big had happened to them. So yeah. Yes. Well, we get a, a major death like halfway through. True. Which, which sort yeah. of shows raises the that, bar. Mm-hmm. Shows that people can be killed. I um. It's interesting that you mentioned whether or not you were worried or about the main characters or whether you thought there was enough peril because I think in Star Wars novels. That's not always so much a concern for me. Like in Kenobi, we knew Obi-Wan would survive. But what was more mm-hmm. interesting was how the characters would get to where they were going. And in Razor's Edge, it was how are they going to get caught? Like, I really liked that the, the bad guy was a Loridian because she was a big challenge for Leia's diplomatic skills. And there's a scene toward the beginning where Leia has to, like, control all of her expressions and control mm-hmm. exactly how much truth she tells. So it was almost like I wasn't worried about Leia dying, but I was worried about her getting really embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> well, and, and I never thought about this again, the power of discussion. But when Leia has to control her emotions, it, it's very a uh, prequel Jedi, isn't it? You know, you oh, know. That's interesting. I level off that. your emotions and uh, and hide hide that. And, and it, it reminded me a lot of 1984, actually, thought crimes and and how uh, you're not supposed to convey certain types of emotion, or you can. Or they can you can be perceived, and they of course were reading Leia's face, and she's such a, a diplomat and a politician. And it's it's a part of her DNA. It's a part of her of how she was raised. So that was an interesting aspect of it as well. But but Corey, you didn't really we didn't get it much. We kind of got away from it. But how did you feel about the role of diversity in the book? Very important. And Star Wars is a, an excellent galaxy to have diversity because there's so many different types of characters and races and people. Yeah, and I think every time I go into a Star Wars book, there it seems like there's always like the token Twi'lek and the uh, token yeah. characters, and you're like, oh, we have to put those in there because it's a Star Wars book, you know. It's so like you said, Dan. It's like some of those characters they blended the background; uh, they weren't so prominent for me. Um, but I did feel like, you know, I wanted to know where it was going. I wanted to know uh, who the spy was. I wanted to know a lot of things, so that that kept me engaged in the book. So, but I think, all in all, I think most of the characters, they were well, well written. I also think that they just added to the narrative of Leia, Leia's story. So, I, like I said, it just brings, it really blossoms Leia out, uh, if you want to say it that way. So, every character kind of added to that. And like you get, we've been saying all along, it's just, she just reinforces her character as far as kind of this in-between era where she's kind of trying to, you know, balance her, you know, relationship with Han and... I think it's it's really it just adds to uh, her character and all in all in general. So it's uh, they were well done, but I, I don't think they were as strong as, as maybe they could have been. I have a question in relation to this. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, did you guys think that it was really it was obvious who the spy was, or did it keep you guessing? Inter- Corey, why don't you? What do you think? Huh. That's interesting because I'm the type of person who thinks I've got it figured out in the end, and I you know have your doubts, and you're like you know back and forth on things. I thought, it, and this is, I thought it was somewhat obvious. Yeah. Just because there, yeah. you really don't have a lot of options. But uh, but I will say, even though I don't think it was necessarily predictable as much as it was obvious once the big reveal came about. I mean, you could see it coming 
but there's there weren't so many tells that that you found it to be distracting. I I, th- I thought it was clever. Um, I mean, juxtaposed to other things where you know, oh, the butler did it, or you can tell yeah. what's going to happen. To, did, what did you think, Megan? Well, I I predicted it pretty early on, and I kind of didn't want it to be Kifar because hmm. he was like he was mean. He was mean to Han all the time. It was like it just seemed really obvious to me that he didn't. Not that he didn't want to be there, but that he didn't like being there. Mm-hmm. And I thought, right up until the reveal, I thought, he's got to be a distraction. It's got to be somebody else who's nicer, because if he was a better spy, he would be nicer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I thought it was really obvious that it was him. It didn't take away from my enjoyment of the book, but I wanted to find out what other people thought, because it was well, pretty obvious to me. It, well, I think so, and I think what, when I'm when we're looking at it, I, I think the reason it didn't bother me much is... I didn't feel like that was her big thing. That she, that was like something that she was going to schedule in there and and surprise us. I I didn't feel like that was something. That, I mean, I knew she wanted to surprise people, but I don't feel like that was one of her main goals. It much different than with Kenobi and of course the huge surprise with the pronouns there yeah. and the, and the str- and maybe that's why it didn't knock me out the way that uh, the the big twist in Kenobi did because. I don't know. It, it just was a different impact. It had different ramifications, like you said, Megan. He or Corey, he was a jerk to Han all along. So, of course, he's going to be the, you know, the traitor. Like you said, it wasn't the reveal wasn't um, shocking. Um, but like, it's interesting, Dan, that you compared to Kenobi because it's obviously it's too- hard not to because the, since oh, they're sure. back but- to back. Well, not only that, but like, like I said, I compared it to uh, the Thrawn trilogy and um, and uh, Zahn's, uh, Zahn's work uh, because we do we we we're immediately drawn into uh, this new world and it's a different author. It's her first book, and we're, we're curious to see okay, how she's going to play out this. And um, it, it's just written differently. And I'm, I would be curious to think if somebody else was to write it, if they would do maybe a not such a good job with maybe Leia and and maybe a better job in other places. You know what I'm saying? So it's yeah, I, yeah. I think. They're they're hard. The three are to me, they're very hard characters to write because yes. again, we all have our very specific idea of how they should sound. It's it's intimidating. Corey, you're a writer, and Megan, you write too. I mean, are these the kind of characters that you would want to try to tackle. I mean, in many ways, it would be the ultimate challenge and the ultimate joy. But there's so much vested in these characters, which leads me really to uh, as far as the non-canonical characters in the book, are there certain ones that that really spoke to you that you thought, I really want to read more about this person. I mean, for the most part, a lot of them were probably characters that we didn't really matter to us if we saw them or not, but which ones stood out to you and you thought, I want more? Well, I'm going to go back to my earlier answers and say that I still want more of Anna Carrot for doing her whatever smuggling thing. Mm-hmm. Um, in my interview, I did an interview with Martha Wells on my blog and she talked about what further adventures Anna Carrot could have, or I think she said, um, Sion joining Rogue Squadron and those sounded really cool. Oh, too. that would be cool. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, a lot of the characters that were in the book, like you said, they were kind of, I don't, I don't want to call them background characters because they, some of them were, some of them weren't. Uh, none of them really rode me all that great as far as like, oh, I'd love to know what, you know, so-and-so does or like to follow them just because I think that's not what they're there for. Uh, I think they were, the way they were used in, in this book, they were just more of a side character as far as Promoting the, the kind of the 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 plot of the book. Um, I don't know. It's hard to choose. I guess. I, I guess I never, didn't. None of them really stood out that much to me to want to follow them along. But that's just me. I guess. Sorry. <laughs> and, and as soon as I um, I realized this was my turn to talk, I said I blank. But the character who who's the the main big bad uh, when and that she can read faces. What's her name? I was just I was just trying to think of the names. I... It's Viest. I have the dramatic person next to me. There you go. I probably should have done that. Yeah, beat me to it. <laughs> I'm cheating. Don't worry. That's all right. That's using your resources. VS VS would be if I had to pick a non canonical character it would be it would be VS. I found huh. found her to be intriguing. I mean, it's pretty much um, a one dimensional villain, but I, but I like that she was a good foil for Leia. An interesting challenge for her. I'm wondering uh, what the thought process was to have uh, one of the main villains female was it because leia is a female or did that just just fit the role of the story better that's a good yeah. question 
we could probably have a whole other discussion about choosing a female villain to go against a female hero and whether or not mm-hmm. that is restrictive or whether or not that's a good thing. Um, mm-hmm. I certainly didn't mind it. I think no. that she was a good foil for, for Leia because of her particular talents. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah. And they, they do work well, but, but it, but it is, it does an interesting thing to look at it. I mean, how would this be different if there was a guy, maybe they didn't make it as a male character because then we would have sexual, uh, even more tension. And then of course, Han Solo's, oh. um, peacock feathers would have to come out even more. And there would be, there would be a lot more, um, yeah. that would become a whole other sort of a novel then. That's so I don't know, maybe that would be too much angst. See, that's, that's not the direction I took. As soon as I thought of a gender bent beast, I thought that people might think that he didn't have enough of a, a dramatic death scene. People would say he was too weak if he died where Viest did in the book. Um, but I don't know. That's every fan has a different um, perspective on that. So that's I don't interesting. Know. Talk a little bit more about that. I'm interested to hear to why, why you came to that conclusion. <laughs> well, I mean, I just thought of it now. Um, <laughs> let's try, though. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't. I hadn't thought at all of the fact that there would be a potential like romantic tension there, and I'm glad there wasn't. And oh, me if, too. If she, if Martha Wells said, "Oh, we didn't make her a man because we thought that tension was unnecessary," I would be mm-hmm. like, "Fantastic." Mm-hmm. Um, and very true, very true. Yeah, because there's it, that just wouldn't really be necessary. But I think, I don't know, the other thing is that we've seen characters like that who are male before. She's almost a Lando figure where she's <laughs> she has a whole operation and she's like running this whole scene. She's almost a Jabba figure. I don't know how many female crime lords we've seen in Star Wars. Right. So, Which is cool. And I think that that's probably more a reflection of our culture now uh, and, where, and where, we have, where we have evolved from. I can't even think off the top of my head of anything from popular culture or mythology where there is um, a male hero or a, a male villain and a female, but there's no, none of the tension, the sexual tension, but just, just that general good guy, bad guy animosity. Can you think of I, any, I will bring one up. I, I recently watched the, the new dread uh, movie, <laughs> but I've seen it twice. I own it. It's a great movie. Seriously? Oh, it's I cool. Heard it's much better than it looked initially. I've not seen it, but I've heard good things about it. It's pretty. Wow. Uh, it's pretty gory. If it's not your thing, is gore and, and some, some bad language and things like that. Um, I definitely don't want my kids watch it. But um, the the idea there is he's this gruff, you know, police officer in a futuristic world, and she's uh, basically. A drug kingpin, and she runs this whole building, and just you know, you don't mess with her, and you don't, and she's just very raw, and there's and like they say, there's no sexual tension whatsoever. It's just raw physical uh, violence, and I think that matchup was interesting to me because I think in the end, obviously the hero wins, and you know the the female dies, but in the storyline, that these well, I'm, I don't know. If, I'll go this far into it, but um, <laughs> spoiler warning for dread. <laughs> spoiler warning for dread. Have you guys seen it? No. Are you going to De- see it? This is let's, this Maybe. is our decaf with dread. Section. I guess so. Yeah. This is just <laughs> anyway. It's like in the in the story, the the main characters are these cops, so they can actually carry out sentencing and basically kill people. So that's that's they can do all in one with swift blow. So in the end, he comes against this this female character, and I'm always like, okay, how do you? I mean. It, to me, it's like you don't see a lot of guys hitting girls, and if this whole thing has been about you know physical violence, how no. is he going to do this? Yeah, you definitely don't want that. I mean, that's, no. there's no place that. And they really or don't. Anywhere. Yeah, they really don't do that. And I, I won't go into any more details, but it was interesting the matchup, like you said. We don't. It's not a typical matchup. It was something different. And so that's what was interesting to me about the that the, the idea in the film. Well, and to be clear, I I think that the reason that it is a female character. Um, it doesn't really matter because it's a character. It's it's a unique, interesting character that's a nice foil for Leia. It doesn't have to be a guy or a girl per se. And I, I think Leia is strong enough on her own that it really wouldn't make a difference. She's clearly shown uh, through going head to head with Tarkin and Vader and and all kinds of other characters throughout her history. That's not necessarily incredibly important. And it doesn't have to be about physical violence, whether it's a male 
villain or a female villain. It's the I, interplay and the tension. I, I wish that wasn't important, but I think it it is. You so many people think so many different ways about gender, and um, what you said about dread was interesting because I don't. It's not like I'm gonna advocate violence against women for its right. own sake, but I do think that within that concept of you can't show a female villain being defeated, there's a bit of sexism there itself because. Yes. You're saying, oh, she's fragile, and no matter how evil she is, you still shouldn't hit her because she'll, like, break. And <laughs> I I can't think of... I was racking my brain trying to think of another, like, big conflict between a male and a female that didn't I just have any one. tension. I, I just oh, thought yeah. another one, too. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, Hunger Games. Um... I don't know much about the later two books. Well, so I can't really contribute there. No, the what, which character? The first book that was oh. enough, but but I did see the the first two films, and I, I think the the president and and Katniss. There, there's an excellent interplay there between the two. Well, that's yeah, that's more of a mind game thing too. Well, and and that's you know, that's not that's all it's necessary. But Megan brings up some really strong points. One of the things that makes Buffy the Vampire Slayer such a powerful show is there that, you go, yeah. It's Buffy, yeah. you know. Buffy's not afraid to mix it up, and she definitely um, gets into her share of skirmishes more than her share of skirmishes, and it, it just magnifies her character. And, and, it, and it, the tension that is there, of the drama that is there, is very strong and palpable. Now, could Leia handle something like that? Would we, as an audience, accept Princess Leia in that sort of um, interplay with another with another character? I mean, when when she's about to be tortured in A New Hope um, by that. Uh, now very antiquated looking robot with the syringe that's going towards her, the thing. The door slams down because we as an audience can't see that. Which which I think is appropriate. And it we, is. I mean, we see Han being tortured later, but I don't mm-hmm. know that it would be appropriate to linger on that for Leia. But no, it, yes. it, everybody has a different, it's hard to talk about this stuff because everybody sees it from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, Jedi Academy video game, there was a female antagonist but she was sort of had a revealing costume and there's a little bit of tension uh, there yeah. if you played a male character if i remember it correctly and see and that's one of the reasons why i like this character is that it wasn't about sexuality it's about uh being a yes. strong female power and it didn't have to be about revealing clothing or or some sort of sexual tension it was just more about this is who this character is and and there's power in that yeah, you know, yeah. You, can use, you can use your sexuality or not, but this character it wasn't. There were other things at play, other motivations, which, one, is, which is a nice thing to see. I was going to say yeah. one one more example. I think that popped in my head was uh, Terminator Two with Sarah Connor. Oh, great example! Versus uh, the, the 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 machine. Uh, is it T one thousand? Yeah, mm-hmm. and she's buff. She's built. She's shooting guns. Uh, she's like an assassin. I mean. She's taking folks down physically again, like we we're saying, and it's it's and she's also vulnerable, vulnerable, right? Because it's it's her son, and she's trying to protect him, and she knew this was coming. Comparing her to Leia is obviously <laughs> quite a difference there. Um, she's I think like, we we've, we've reversed our criteria a little. We're yeah. looking for male heroes who defeat male for, yeah. female villains in order to illustrate a point about female heroes. I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and well, that's the interesting thing. What what's the difference there? You know, yeah. How how do you how do you parlay well, the two? Well, like you were know, saying, though. if it, if it's a female, and maybe this is a huge tangent. I, first thing I think this is pretty fascinating. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, but a female villain versus a male hero, uh, and then what if you have a female hero versus a male villain? You know how much? How do you write that? Uh, cleverly and not just fall into the typical archetypes that have become so nauseating over the years. Well, I can bring it back to Star Wars. Uh, we can take a look at Padme in the prequels. I mean, mm-hmm. she stood up for herself. Um, you know, I led a, led a, a nation, not led a world to uh, against the tr- the Trade Federation. You know, oh. and what was going on there. Go ahead. That reminds me, I have an actual example. Obi Wan and Anakin at different times fighting Asajj Ventress. They beat her. There you go. I mean, she keeps coming back, but oh they, yes. <laughs> yeah. And what you reminded me of was the episode. I think it's called Assassin. One of my favorite Clone Wars episodes where Padme mm-hmm. and Ahsoka fight Ventress. 
So, oh, good. I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, there you go. That's and Ahsoka's a great character, too. We talk about female characters. There you go. <laughs> we could go on a whole tangent about that, but I think I would oh, require easy. time. A alone. lot more coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Ventress is an amazing character as well. Yeah, she's one of my favorites, and I can't believe I didn't I think of her earlier. Cause, I know, like, I know. Shame on us, villain. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Maybe we, maybe we, maybe did someone accidentally give us decaf? Is that the problem? <laughs> maybe, maybe that was the could be. Well, Megan, you had mentioned earlier your interview with Martha. Uh, talk to us a little bit about about that and how that came about. And we obviously we interviewed Martha on our last on our last uh, book chat. We're an awesome person in a Star Wars presence. Uh, very talented writer. Tell us, tell us your experiences with Martha. Yeah, she was really nice. You guys probably got to know a little more of her personality than I did because I spoke to her over email. Um, but you can find her interview at blogfullofwords.blogspot.com. And um, I we will certainly to her. post a link to that as well for sure. Cool. Um, I wanted to talk to her especially because female author writing female character, but also because she'd been a fan fiction writer. So we talked about that a little bit. And uh, she was really nice. I think I had I had fun in my interactions with her, but our interactions were not particularly deep. It was pretty quick, but it was fun. Yeah, she's very very accommodating, very very easy to work with. Yeah, uh, which which is great. And and as are you, Megan. And and while we have you on, what do you think? Uh, is there a want or a need for a sequel to Razor's Edge? Well, to me. Uh, Honor Among Thieves is the sequel to Razor's Edge. I would love to see another Leia book, but I hadn't been thinking about it because I'd been so set on seeing the Empire and Rebellion trilogy as a trilogy, which loosely followed each other. Now we've got this whole thing where maybe it's not a trilogy, the subtitle was removed, so I'm not sure what that means. I hope we still get the Luke novel. So I guess I feel like we are getting a sequel because presumably Leia will be somewhere in the Han book. Um, and I wouldn't complain about another Leia standalone novel either. Well, and, and really, are there any unresolved threads from Razor's Edge that you would like to see come back? I know you you mentioned your favorite character earlier, but is there is there any is there anything in here that because I can't imagine? Um, and really, to me, Razor's Edge was written because we want to know and see more about Leia and, and what makes her tick. But other than that, I don't know that there's a big call for some sort of a sequel because I feel like everything resolved, was resolved pretty cleanly. And, it, and it's not like there's certain characters that are out there that I, that I really want to follow more. Like, um, oh, geez, why am I drawing such a blank? Annaline. Annaline, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's so no Annaline ended up on Alderaan. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> not, not a good place to be. But there is no, no Annaline character really in Razor's Edge that, I, that I'd be curious to see more about. Yeah, I agree. It was a very self-contained story, and although part of me would love to follow the pirates to more piratey adventures, I don't, it would be, it's hard for me to think of a full-length novel about them, and so I, I would say it wrapped itself up pretty well. Yeah, my only thought would be, uh, like you said, the the pirates and, and maybe their misadventures, and maybe an ebook follow-up or a Maybe yeah. a, a prequel to this book of some sort, but um, yeah, I'd be. I'm interested to kind of move on to Honor Among, Among Thieves and see where that one goes. And I don't know if it's it's a direct. Um, well, sequel. Martha pretty much. I mean to cut you off, Corey. No, go ahead. Martha yeah. pretty much said that um, she had no idea what the other authors were doing. There was really not a lot of communication or interaction there, if memory serves from our interview. So. I don't think we're going to see too many threads at all. Maybe the editors will throw a, a sentence in here or there. I'm actually yeah. looking at the page right now as we speak, um, and the description describes a whole lot different to what uh, Razor's Edge was about. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to check it out. I think that um, Honor Among Thieves will only be a sequel and that Leia will be in it because of what she said, Martha Wells that is said that about that she doesn't have much input into the other books. I think mm-hmm. it's it's a sequel in the same way that the entire EU is a sequel. Oh, or interesting. Are sequels to each oh, other. Nice. Yeah. Because that's what I mean by sequel. It could be written by a different author and still be a sequel. True. Very true. I mean, that's, I mean, heck, how many, all of the Jedi Order was just like that too, really. <laughs> yeah. So now, so now let's look at, um, let's give our overall rating. I mean, and people can look up our reviews online anytime, but I'll just go first. I gave it a three out of five, uh, mostly because I thought that Leia was fleshed out beautifully and um, added to the narrative for me. 
other than that, I, I didn't think it was a story that we were waiting around dying to hear about. But because of Martha's writing and her characterization, how she portrays Leia and Han and as individuals and uh, together as an, as a, an ensemble, uh, that's where uh, it raises it to a three out of five for me. Can I give it an eight out of ten? I need more numbers. <laughs> sure, <laughs> absolutely. Sure, yeah. I um I really liked it. It's one of the top. I would say I read all six, seven Star Wars novels that came out this year, and it's number one or number two in my on my list. Fascinating. Um, where do you put Kenobi were, in that? I I have mixed feelings about Kenobi. That's another thing we could talk about forever. I thought the prose <laughs> was really really good, but talk about expectations. That book did hmm. not. Ha- it didn't. Not that it didn't reach my expectations, because my expectations and what um, Jen Heddle and John Jackson Miller wanted that book to be were just different things. So I have mixed feelings about Kenobi, but um, yeah, Razor's Edge. Um, I loved the characterization. There were some problems. Um, the prose was a little, a little boring at times which is why I'm going to subtract two points. But otherwise... So you're going to give it now a six? No, oh. no, still eight. Yeah. Oh, still <laughs> eight. Which is out of ten, yeah. Oh, I see. Well, <laughs> what, let's just pretend that you had to pick it out of five. Would you give that a four out of five, four and a half? Three and a half? I'd say it sounds like a three and a half. Yeah, maybe three and a half. Three, three point yeah. seven five, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, what about you, Corey? Uh, I'm, I'm going to start with you on that, Dan. Uh, I agree. It was a really solid three. And I'll be honest... I read. I hadn't read it until I read your review. I was just kind of late in the game. And I, <laughs> no, I was. I was just. Oh, yeah, I was busy. And uh, sure. And you said, "Hey, you know, check out my review." And I was like, "Okay." So I read your review, and your your review actually helped me get into it. And I was like, "Oh, this is this is interesting and fascinating." And I wanted to know why you thought those things. So uh, you know, I got got into it and dug into it. But um, yeah, like we said, uh, um, the storyline was was good. I don't think it was great, but. Like we said, Martha did a great job of characterizing uh, Leia and really fleshing the story along as far as that went. And the interplay, like we've been saying all along, these characters are hard and difficult to write for anybody, I think, just because it's such a beloved saga for anybody who's getting into these books. And I, I love the fact that, that Megan loved it and because she's, you know, you got a lot out of it that you wanted to get out of it. And I think that's... It's gonna do. The book is gonna do what it's supposed to do for each fan, and they're gonna you know love it or hate it for those reasons. And if that's the case, then you know Martha did a good job in mm-hmm. telling a story. I think um, it's a solid three out of five, and it definitely needs to be uh, picked up and read and to you know just to pique people's interest and to see what they think about it too. Well, particularly if you're a Leia fan, and, and I think that I think anyone who's listening to Megan talk about it, Megan is making me actually want to reread the book, which I didn't think I would ever do. <laughs> So that's cool. I, I really think that Martha Martha Wells, you know, I don't know what um, Delroy had instructed her to do or, or requested that she do would probably be a better way to phrase it. Um, I think with with the keys to the particular vehicle she was given, I think she got the best mileage out of it that she possibly could, if we could extend that metaphor. Because there really weren't, I mean, it's between episodes four and five. There's only so far you can go with her and Han. Um, so she, they really looked at uh, her being a leader with all this doubt in her mind and turmoil and, and see these weaknesses in her uh, that end up being strengths because of how she uses them uh, and doesn't let them weigh her down. So I think as far as adding to Leia's character, if you are a Leia fan or even a remote Leia fan, I think Razor's Edge is a book that you cannot miss. So Megan, of course, uh, we've got our five questions that we want to ask you kind of uh, yes or no, one word, one sentence answers uh, that we like to ask all of all of our our guests here on Cough with Kenobi. So I'm going to start with asking you, what is your favorite Star Wars movie? Uh, Return of the Jedi. Wow. Wow, Usually. that's becoming a favorite around here. Yeah, that is, you're the third person in the world to say that. It, it might overtake yes. Empire. <laughs> okay, your favorite character of the saga? Uh, I'll go with Luke. There are a lot of favorites, but Luke is a good one. Your favorite line of dialogue or film moment? Oh, no. A uh, film moment. Some sort of acrobatic flip that Darth Maul does in episode one. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> the fight choreography in the Duel of the Fates. The whole thing. How about oh, that? Oh, yeah. Nick <laughs> Juilliard really coming, really bringing it right there. Yes. <laughs> okay, if you collect, what is your favorite collectible that you own? Um, I, I, c- 
collect only very few things, very random things. I gotta think about this for a moment. I'm gonna go back to Darth Maul again. I have a small collection of Darth Maul figures, and I have one that was at Celebration 5, and the gentleman manning the booth who was selling the action figures had a set, and there was one Darth Maul with, like, he had his regular black cloak, but it had red trim on the side, and I said, can I have just that one without the set? And at first he was like, eh, but finally he gave it to me. So I like that one because it's different and because the vendor was nice to me. That's pretty cool. Are you a Black <laughs> Series person, the six inch? Um, to be honest, I'm not enough of a collector to be able to know what figure is what series. I just know if I look at them and I think they look cool. <laughs> wow. In many ways, I envy you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, I know every Star Wars novel, so I've got my own little yes, you've definitely uh, annoying database. <laughs> you've definitely placed a, a strong niche for yourself. And and finally, what particular messages or themes about the Star Wars saga resonate or speak to you? Um, good versus evil, the ability to gain your dreams, um, to become what you want to become. Yeah, and I think that's a good strong message for for people, especially. Uh, when you're growing up with these films, seeing uh, the power of choice too. So I like that. And everybody likes, it's the Harry Potter thing. Everybody likes to believe that they're destined for something else and you compared yourself to Luke and getting off yeah. the tattooing <laughs> many times anyway. So that makes sense. I've, uh, I've become a little cynical about that when we're getting out of college because Luke didn't pull himself up by his own bootstraps. He had Obi-Wan to help him. Absolutely. And I think that in a way that teaches a bad lesson that we have to wait for someone to come rescue us. But that's a tangent, and I really do like the message of that you are, you have, anyone can have heroism in them. And oh, that, boy. Yeah. You just opened I up. Just, I, just, I just thought of a great of question, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, that's well, no, no, that's perfect. <laughs> Don't be sorry. Seriously, that's really fascinating. What were you going to say about that, Corey? Uh, well, she mentioned um, how Obi-Wan kind of had to, like, you know, bring Luke out of Tatooine and kind of boost him along. And get him going. And I I got thinking. I think, what if you know Luke would have just went off and got those? Uh, what's he trying to get? Um, power toss the yeah, power converters. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. if he went and got power converters instead of clean up the droids? <laughs> mm. uh, you know? Yeah. No. I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm a big what if guy. The force. He would have got there eventually, right? If he was going to go join the rebellion and you know the rebellion against the empire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I. I think that there was a really narrow window there and Luke could have missed his chance and he'd start having force visions and not know where they came from. Ah, well, this is, uh, yeah, well, that's, that's pretty cool. And it's all, it's Joseph Campbell, the, the hero's journey. It's as old as, as Merlin and King Arthur and, and before that, but the mentor, mm-hmm. the old mentor has to come down and has to pass the baton, yeah. the talisman to the hero so that the hero can go on his journey and he has to lose his father figure. It's all very, it's all myth. I mean, Joseph yeah. Campbell said that George Lucas was his best student, so it it does puzzle a lot of interesting questions of free will versus destiny. But definitely yeah. m- uh, more of a sorting hat discussion. And I love that <laughs> hero story. I've just looked at it, and this is another great thing about Star Wars and fandom in general. As I age and go through different stages of my life, I look at it differently, and I'm sure everybody does that too. So that's oh, yes. a whole other discussion. So, oh, it, absolutely. And just just every every time you look at this stuff, and even our listeners who are listening to it now are probably talking uh, to the podcast, and and just and they have the different ways of looking at you just by different things that we've all talked about on this show. And Corey, I cut you off. What were you going to say? Well, I was going to say, the Star Wars grows with you. And because we're fans of the saga, it, it's going to continue to grow with us as we get older and look back on our life. And, you know, whatever we're, situation we're in in that moment, you know, we're going to relate it to the the saga in our own way and like you said you're you know just moving along with your life and you equate that to you know your your favorite film moment at the time you know so yeah Good and point. i think luke is one of my favorites because everyone can see themselves in him yes and in different right. ways too so yeah yeah that's cool for sure okay well megan thank you so much uh for coming on to for our book review of razor's edge i, I know it's something we've been talking about for months having you on the show i think it was even before it was even was it just after it was released probably because we had originally talked about razor's edge so it must have been somewhere around there 
I think so, or shortly after we got review copies of it, because it was definitely something that we knew there was plenty to talk about. And and I and I think Corey, uh, I speak for Corey when I say just what you brought to the discussion. Um, I didn't know if we were going to talk for twenty minutes, half hour, and we've been going on for over an hour. And there's probably so much more we could do. So thank you so much, Megan, for bringing your insights uh, into this discussion. And where can our listeners find you and, and interact with you? Um, your listeners can find me at blogfullofwords.blogspot.com. Um, on Twitter, it's pretty much the same thing, at blogfullofwords. Um, I also write for Knight's Archive and occasionally Fangirl Blog. Very good, and we will certainly put all of those links on our show notes. So, Megan, thank you again very much for having a cup of coffee with us, and uh, we look forward to having you on a show in the future. Great. Thanks for having me. If you'd like to respond to our question of the show, have a comment, or just want to say hello, send us an email at feedback at coffeewithkenobi.com. Or if you have a specific question or comment for either of us individually, email us at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com or Corey C at coffeewithkenobi.com or visit us at coffeewithkenobi.com and click on the Contact Us section or comment on one of the stories featured on the site. If you enjoy the show, please write a review on iTunes or listen to us on the Zoom Windows Media Marketplace. You can also like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash cough with Kenobi, as well as keep up to date at our Twitter feed at twitter.com forward slash cough with Kenobi. You can also find us on Tumblr at coughwithkenobi.tumblr.com. If you enjoy the jazz music, download the album Eye to Eye by Steve Torok on iTunes. Give the evacuation code signal. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited and is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names and sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney or their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi, unless otherwise indicated. There's no one here. Move along. Move along. <laughs>